we've got this video courtesy of tom segura the well-known comedian who's also part of your mum's house and has various other podcasts that he does also you know uh two bears one cave and i think another interview show he went viral the last week or so because of this video that he put out where he essentially chastises his audience for complaining about the fact that him and his co-host Burke Reicher on their podcast Two Bears One Cave quite often talk about a lot of like rich guy shit right a lot of like middle age not middle, middle age sorry a lot of like 50 year old plus rich guy shit where you know you've, you've been grinding for a while and then you suddenly become wealthy in your like late 40s or maybe late 30s early 40s and you're now starting to enjoy the things that you could never enjoy prior like first class fights no first class flights sorry not fights private jets um swanky trainers because you know la types they love you know la dads love to wear like norm core clothes and like funky like you know trainers like sbs and whatnot or jordans to appear cool and hip you know trendy beard cuts and whatnot and eat at lavish places and i guess the fan base have just had enough of it and they don't really like it so some of them have been complaining to like keep the rich guy shit to yourselves but Tom Segura clearly doesn't feel the same and he felt he needed to send out a bit of a PSA to his fans. This is Tom Segura's clip where he took and he's basically talking about that. I'm going to play it now so you can hear it and then I'll give you my comments on the other side. Every time we talk about like a watch or a car, I'll get us uh, like a, a bunch of messages from losers that try to tell me that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making them feel bad about their situation you're in control of your own situation and your own feelings. So don't put it on me that you feel bad that I have something that, oh, but I, I'm struggling with rent this month. Figure it the fuck out, okay? <laughs> like, don't make my life be a problem for your life. If you don't like it, guess what? You're not going to be able to control what people talk about. People are going to talk about things that you don't have for the rest of your fucking life. Here's the thing. If you're, if you're still mad about this, just know that it's your mindset and you're thinking like a fucking loser, but you don't have to. You don't. You can change the way you think, but you have to accept the way you're thinking right now is not going to get you anywhere. You're being bitter. You're being petty. You're insecure. You're not confident. If you just sit around and you, you know what? You only have what you have because of fans. So don't talk about us like that. Yeah, but you're still a loser if you're thinking like that. You're maybe uh I'm lucky to have you as a loser fan, but you don't have to be that way. You, can you could be a winner as at the end. I thought that's absolutely hilarious because I think, I don't know, my impressions are twofold. I think when I was younger, I had far more maybe envy or I'd feel far more FOMO because I legitimately couldn't do the things I was seeing people that I looked up to were doing or people maybe I looked up to people that were doing the things that I wanted to do like in terms of an occupation or in terms of a you know career or in terms of a you know um, business they launched like that was something that I had an idea of doing so when I saw people that were you know very young creative directors maybe who had published works on magazines or platforms that I wanted to be a part of, who maybe had, you know, work exhibited at particular galleries or particular competitions or people that had two particular brands that were very fluid, able to kind of move between different, you know, sectors and areas and whatnot. That would obviously give me a bit of FOMO because I just couldn't work out how they did it. But then as soon as you get a little bit older and you gain a bit more experience and you start to maybe figure life out a bit, you just start to realize that a lot of that stuff is quite in reach. It's not that difficult to do. It looks really wild, but if you actually want to do it, it's not that hard. Obviously, there's no guarantees that you will also become the creative director of a flipping Louis Vuitton or something. You know, that's obviously not on the cast for everybody. But if you want to launch your own little studio, your own little creative studio where you have a small, you know, uh, a small selection of brands that you work with um, on particular projects throughout the year and whatnot and present this image that you're this guy that wakes up at you know 6 a.m and goes for a run and jumps in his g-wagon and heads to the office with your nice flipping furniture with your nice you know office and whatnot and you call people that work alongside it's not that difficult of a dream to kind of put into motion it sounds really far-fetched when you're, you know, like me at that time when you're working retail somewhere and you're actually fighting to get hours. Imagine, imagine working at a retail job that you legitimately hate and you don't want to be there. You know, because we all get, I think, especially when you're in the creative world, you kind of get roped into the idea that you have to kind of work on the 
shop floor in order to get to the office, which is a real misnomer. You don't. You could legitimately just do your own thing and work like a, well, you could work in a flipping supermarket and do your own thing on the side as like, you know, launch a magazine or set up a brand and just pitch yourself to the actual brands or the companies that you want to work for and, and get in straight away to head office without having to do the whole like dream from shop floor thing. But usually when you are working on shop floor, like I was and you sold that dream or you, you know, you kind of was naive enough to believe it, you will kind of start to think, how can I get to a place where that create like how imagine for instance when i was growing up my people that i looked up to were the james jebbias the chris you know the chris gibbs the hiroshi fujiwaras the negos those are what my kind of what brenda would say north stars those are the people that i looked at i wasn't looking at the people in between i didn't really give a fuck i knew that in order to kind of shift culture leave my mark on the flipping cultural timeline i need to be on that kind of level I'd be looking at myself thinking, I'm in this retail store. How am I ever going to become my version or whatever I want to be in terms of, you know, my version of a Hiroshi Fujiwara is so far away. But you don't realize until you get older that actually isn't. All you need to do is just start, you know, making projects, making little products and stuff. And maybe, you know, maybe not selling them, maybe just showcasing them on your Instagram and whatnot. And just, you know, displaying that you have an ability to do A and B, that you maybe have an ability to communicate certain ideas. You maybe have an ability to kind of present, you know, works in different ways, prototypes, different things, put things to productions, explore different ways of doing this and that and whatnot. And then suddenly now, you are basically in the same sort of realm. You know, it doesn't really take that much. Just a Shopify account, you know, monthly, uh, uh, you know, flipping subscription to your Photoshop, which is amazing. When I was growing up, I had to get a flipping, uh, what's that thing called? I had to get one that was pirated and whatnot, but now you can essentially, everyone can afford a fully stocked version of Photoshop and Illustrator by paying anywhere between like $8 and flipping $20 a month, which is peanuts, considering what everyone's paying on their flipping streaming services and whatnot. And you could easily get that done. So that whole kind of like envy or feeling jealousy of people in terms of what they have in terms of jobs and careers, I think is mostly when you're younger, don't know how to get to that point with yourself. I think when it comes to Tom Segura and these comedy podcasts, to be fair to the fans, it's not that they're complaining that you're always talking about rich guy shit. It's that for the most part, I think most fans of most podcasts, doesn't have to be even comedy ones like you know stand-up comics. It can be any podcast. I think we've all kind of seen, I've seen it myself with stuff like, the Joe Budden podcast and that original lineup of Rory and Moore, that eventually when the money starts to get a little bit higher or, you know, the clout is getting, you know, more and more, whatever it may be, the relationships crumble and you see people change. Now, it's not only because of money, but you know the dynamics of relationship were much different when Joe Budden was recording that podcast, you know, from I think it's Parks's first or well, Parks's home I think that was the original location and then it slowly started to change once it started to get a bit more money they upgraded the studio or Parks moved into a new place the you know the, the camera started to get a bit more shiny the mics got a little bit better everything started to become a little bit better but then the quality of the pod kind of dropped and obviously Joe Budden's star or head got a little bit bigger and it got worse and it stopped getting funny after a while it became a really serious type of pod and maybe there's a lot of baggage behind the scenes that they were kind of you know dragging on the show themselves but with comedy podcasts for sure you see it all the time as soon as these guys start to become more successful and the deals start to come in they lose the focus and they forget all the funny stuff and only start to comment or rant about the rich guy shit and it might just be a, a kind of a, it might just be a consequence of just not having much to talk about because it's quite difficult i'd imagine if you're one of those big la comics and you have like three or four shows that you do and you bank shows there's only so much cultural commentary you can do after a while you're going to start having to mine your own sort of life and your own life may be interesting or it may be really funny to you how much you were quoted for a private jet but for the regular person listening to it on their headphones at work whilst they're typing in you know some flipping pivot tables or whatnot into excel it just comes across a little bit boring a little bit kind of you know whatever dead and the opposite of funny so i can understand fans in that respect and i think for the most part it is one of those unfortunate parts of being a avid fan of a pod you're going to reach a stage where you're going to have to decide am i okay with listening to these guys now that they've changed or should i just dump it and go to somewhere else because there's no way you can complain and make them see the way or make them see the error of their ways i very rarely see in a podcast or like kind of 
you know, notice that they've kind of shifted how they are as a person and people don't like it or the fans don't like it and, and kind of adjust. You don't really see that. They usually double or triple down and whoever wants to stay, stays, whoever goes, goes. For me personally, I stopped listening to Two Bears, One Cave a long time ago, mostly because of Burr. He's kind of annoying. I know he's kind of got, he's got a good heart on him, but the way that he kind of centers everything about himself, it's just nauseating. You never seen somebody like, you know, really, really enjoy the sound of their own voice and kind of ask people questions and then finish to answer themselves. And it's just a bit too much to kind of deal with. Um, and I kind of, you know, even your mom's house, the main podcast, I stopped listening to that mainly because it just stopped being funny. It just turned into like, you know, you know, Christina P obviously being married to Tom Segura, you know, just talking about rich people shit. And it's just boring after a while. It's not that anyone's jealous. It's just boring because most people can't relate to it. Number one. And also, I don't know, you're just complaining about the things you can't buy or the things that you have now because of your money that aren't that great. Like, it's like I don't know. It's a little, it comes across a little bit, um, pay, pay, I'm sorry, was it patronizing. Maybe it's patronizing is the right word. I'm not too sure what the word is, but either way, I definitely understand where the fans are coming from. But I also understand from Tom's point of view, it's like, hey, if I had the means to do these things and I want to talk about them, I can talk about them. But the fans are also free to say, fuck you, we're going to move somewhere else. So there should be an acceptance of that. But again, these content creators, these podcasters, these stand ups, they really have a hard time digesting that some people are fans and are also allowed to be critical. That's the interesting side, I think, about a lot of these people. They sometimes have. They want to have like a one-way relationship with fans to just give them the content and then they just absorb it. They don't want any kind of feedback, especially if it's critical, especially if it's somewhat, you know, nuanced. No, it just has to be overall play praise. It has to be, you know, those corny guys that Joe Rogan shares on his Instagram where they get tattoos of his face on their body and stuff. He wants all of that stuff. But when it comes to somebody giving you a sort of, you know, rational, somewhat push back on something that you said in a previous pod or a point you failed to raise or whatever it may be, they suddenly get really defensive and start doubling down and start freaking out. So it must just be a flipping process that everyone kind of goes through. So maybe I shouldn't talk about it too much because maybe when I start making, um, you know, millions of dollars, I might end up changing and being that guy. I really doubt it, but you never know.